Well, good evening again, everybody. Uh, I got a view, one view on the first reading of Star Wars A New Hope. So I'm going to read chapter two. In the first, uh, in the first uh, video of this reading, um, I read the prologue and chapter one. So uh, we are going to uh, continue now our reading of Star Wars A New Hope by George Lucas. Chapter two. It was an old settler saying that you could burn your eyes out faster by staring straight and hard at the sun scorched flatlands of Tatooine than by looking directly at its two huge suns themselves. So powerful was the penetrating glare reflected from those endless wastes. Despite the glare, life could, could and did exist in the flatlands formed by long evaporated seabeds. One thing made it possible, the reintroduction of water. For human purposes, however, the water of Tatooine was only marginally accessible. The atmosphere yielded its moisture with reluctance. reluctance. It had to be coaxed down out of the hard blue sky, coaxed, forced, yanked down to the parched surface. Two figures whose concern was obtaining that moisture was stand, were standing on the slight rise of one of those inhospitable flats. One of the pair was stiff and metallic. A sand pit evaporator sunk securely through sand and into deeper rock. The, next fig, the figure next to it was a good deal more animated, though no less unweathered, sunweathered. Luke Skywalker was twice the age of the 10-year-old evaporator, but, less, but much less secure. At the moment, he was swearing softly at a recalcitrant valve adjuster on the, on the temper, temperamental device. From time to time, he resorted to some unsubtle pounding in place of using the appropriate tool. Neither method worked very well. Luke was sure that the lubricants used on the evaporators went out of the way to attract sand, beckoning seductively to small abrasive particles with an oily gleam. He wiped sweat from his forehead and leaned back for a moment. The most prepossessing thing about the young man was his name. A light breeze tugged at his shaggy hair and baggy work tunic as he regarded the device. No point in staying angry at it, he, he counseled himself. It's only an unintelligent machine. As Luke considered the predicament, a third figure appeared, scooting out from behind the evaporator to fumble awkwardly at the damaged section. Only three of the Treadwell model robot six arms were functioning, and these had seen more wear than the boots on Luke's feet. The machine moved with unsteady stop and start motions. Luke gazed at it sadly, then inclined his head to study the sky. Still no sign of a cloud, and he knew there never would be unless he got that evaporator working. He was about to try it once again when a small, intense gleam of light caught his eye. Quickly, he slipped the carefully cleaned set of micro binoculars from his utility belt and focused the lenses skyward. For long moments, he stared, wishing all the while that he had a real telescope instead of the binox. As he stared, evaporators, the heat, and the day's remaining chores were forgotten. Clipping the binoculars back into, onto his belt, Luke turned and dashed to, for the land speeder. Halfway to the vehicle, he thought to call behind. He thought to call behind him. "Hurry up!" he shouted impatiently. "What are you waiting for? Get in gear! Get in gear!" The treadwell started toward him hesitated, and then commenced spinning at a tight circle, smoke belching from every joint. Luke shouted further instructions and finally gave up in disgust when he realized that it would take more than words to motivate the treadwell again. For a moment, Luke hesitated at leaving the machine behind, but he argued to himself its vital components were obviously shot. So he jumped into the land speeder, causing the recently repaired propulsion floater to list alarmingly to one side until he was able to equalize weight distribution by sliding behind the controls. Maintaining his, its altitude slightly above the sandy ground, 
the light duty transport vehicle steady itself like a boat on the heavy sea. Luke gunned, gunned the engine, which whined in protest, and sand erupted behind the floater as he aimed the craft toward the distant town of Anchorhead. Behind him, a pitiful beacon of black smoke from the burning robot continued to rise into the clear desert air. It wouldn't have to be there when Luke returned. There were scavengers of metal as well as flesh in the wide wastes of Tatooine. Metal and stone structures bleached white by the glaze of two, two, twin Tattoo 1 and 2 huddled together tightly for company as much as for protection. They formed the nexus of the widespread farming community of Anchorhead. Presently, the dusty, unpaved streets were quiet, deserted. Sandflies buzzed lazily at, in the cracked caves of poor stone buildings. A dog barked in the distance, the sole sign of habitation, until a lone old woman appeared and started across the street. Her metallic sun shawl was pulled tight around her. Something made her look up, tired eyes squinting into the distance. The sound suddenly leaped in volume as a shining rectangular shape came roaring around a far corner. Her eyes popped as the vehicle bore down on her, showing no signs of altering its path. She had to scramble to get out of its way. Panting and waving an angry fizz after the land speeder, she raised her voice over the sound of its passage. Won't you kids ever learn to slow down? Luke might have seen her, but he certainly didn't hear her. In both cases, his attention was focused elsewhere as he pulled up behind a low, long concrete station. Various coils and rods jutted from its top and sides. Tatooine's relentless sandways broke in frozen yellow spoon against the station's walls. No one had bothered to clear them away. There was no point. They would only return again the following day. Luke slammed the front door aside and shouted, Hey! A rugged young man in a mechanic's dress sat sprawled in a chair behind the station's unkept control desk. Sunscreen oil had kept the skin from burning. The skin of the girl on his lap had been equally protected. And there was a great deal more of the protected area in view. Somehow, even dried sweat looked good on her. Hey, everybody, Luke yelled again, having elicited something less than an overwhelming response. With his first cry, he ran toward the instrument room at the rear of the station with, while the mechanic, half asleep, ran ahead across his face in a moment. Did I hear a young noise blast through here? The girl on his lap stretched sensuously, her well-worn clothing tugging in various intriguing directions. Her voice was calm, casually throaty. Oh, she yawned. That was just wormy on one of its rampages. Deacon Windy looked up with the, from the computer-assisted pool game as Luke burst into the room. They were dressed like much like Luke, although their clothing was a better fit and somewhat less exercised. All three youths contrasted strikingly with the burly, handsome player at the far side of the table. From neatly clipped hair to his precision-cut uniform, he stood out in the room like an oriental poppy in the sea of oats. Behind the three humans, a soft hum came from where a repair robot was working patiently on a broken piece of station equipment. Shape it up, you guys, Luke yelled excitedly. Then he noticed the older man in the uniform. The subject of his suddenly startled gaze recognized him simultaneously. Bix! The man's face twisted a half green. Hey, hello, Luke. Then they were embracing each other warmly. Luke finally stood away, openly admiring the other's uniform. I don't know you were back. When did you get in? The confidence in the other's, other's voice bordered the realm of smugness without quite entering it. Just a little while ago. I wonder the surprise you, hotshot. He indicated the, he indicated the room. I thought you'd be here with the, these other two night crawlers. Deke and Wendy both smiled. I certainly didn't expect you to be out wor working. He laughed easily, a laugh few people found resistible. The academy didn't change him much, Luke commented. But you're back so soon. 
His expression grew concerned. Hey, what happened? Didn't you get your commission? There was something evasive about Biggs as he replied, looking slightly away. Of course I got it. Signed to serve aboard the freighter Rand, uh, Rand eclipsed it just last week. First mate Biggs Darklighter at the service. He performed a twisting salute, half serious and half humorous, and grinned that overbearing yet ingratiating grin at him. I just came back to say goodbye to all you unfortunate landlocked simpletons. They all laughed until Luke suddenly remembered what had brought him here in such a hurry. I almost forgot, he told them. His initial excitement returned. And there's a battle going on right here in our system. Come and look. Deke looked disappointed. Not another one of your epic battles, Luke. Haven't you dreamed up enough of them? Of them? Forget it. Forget it, hell. I'm serious. It's a battle, all right. With words and shoves, he managed to cajole the occupants of the station out into the strong moonlight, sunlight. Cammy came Cammy in particular looked disgusted. This had be, this had better be worth it, Luke, she warned him, shading her eyes against the glare. Luke already had his mic micro binoculars out and was searching the heavens. It only took a moment for him to fix on a particular spot. I told you. He says, there they are. Booves Biggs moved alongside him and reached for the binoculars as the other strained on the aided eyes. A slight read, read adjust, read adjustment provided just enough magnification for Biggs to make out two silvery specks against the dark blue. There's no battle. That's no battle, hotshot, he decided, lowering the binocs and regarding his friend gently. They're just sitting there, two ships, all right. Probably a barge landing a freighter since shadowing hasn't gotten an orbital station. There was a lot of firing earlier, Luke added. His initial enthusiasm was beginning to falter under the with withering assurance of his older friend. Cammy grabbed the binoculars away from Biggs banging them slightly against the support pillar in the process. Luke took them away from her quickly, inspecting the case for death. Take it easy with those. Don't worry so much, Wormy, she sneered. Luke took a step toward her, then halted as a huskier mechanic easily in the process of between them, and favored Luke with a warming, warning smile. Luke considered, shrugged the, in, the incident away. I keep telling you, Luke, Mechanic said with this air of a man tired of repeating the same stories you know about. The rebellion is a long way from here. I doubt if the Empire would fight to keep the system. Believe me, Tatooine is a big bunk, hunk of nothing. His audience began to fade away and back into the station before Luke could mutter a reply. Fixer had his arm around Cammy, and the two of them were chuck chuckling over Luke's ineptitude. Even Dink and Wendy were murmuring among themselves about him, Luke was certain. He followed them, but not without a last glance back and up to the distant rocks. One thing he was sure of were the flashes of light he had seen between the two ships. They hadn't been caused by the sons of Tatooine, reflecting off metal. The binding that locked the girl's hands behind her back was primitive and effective. The constant attention the squad of heavily armed troopers favored her with might have been out of favor her with might have been out of place for one small female, except for the fact that their lives depend on her being delivered safely. When she deliberately so slowed her pace, however, it became apparent that her captors did not mind mistreating her a little. One of the armored figures shoved her brutally in the, in the small of the back, and she nearly fell. Turning, she gave the offending soldiers a vicious look, but she could not tell if it had any effect, since the man's face was completely hidden in his armored helmet. The half, the half, the hallway they eventually emerged into was still smoking around the edges of the smoldering cavity blasted through the hole of the freighter. A portable access access way had been sealed to it, and and the circlet of light showed at the far end of the tunnel, bridging space between the rebel craft and the cruiser. A shadow moved, moved over her as she turned from inspecting the access way, startling her despite her unusual, unshakable self-control. Above her towered the threatening bulk of Darth Vader, red eyes glaring behind the hideous breath mask. 
a muscle twitched in, in one smooth cheek. But other than that, the girl didn't react. Not that, nor was there the slightest shake in her voice. Darth Vader, I should have known. Only you would be so bold and so stupid. Well, the Imperial Senate will not sit still for this. When they hear that you've attacked a diplomat, Senator Leo Organa, Vader rumbled softly, though strongly enough to override her protests. His pleasure at finding her was evident in the way he savored, savored every syllable. Don't play games with me, your highness. He, he continued ominously. You aren't on any mercy mission this time. You passed directly through a restricted system, ignored, ignoring numerous warnings, and completely disregarding our orders to turn about until it no longer mattered. The hills met a skull tipped close. I know that several transmissions were beamed to this vessel by spies within that system. When we trace those transmissions back to the individuals with whom they originated, they had the poor grace to kill themselves before they could be questioned. I want to know what happened to the data that sent you. Neither Vader's words nor his inimical, inim inimical presence appeared to have any effect on the girl. I don't know what you're bla blathering about, she snapped, looking away from him. I'm a member of the Senate on the diplomatic mission that you are part to you to your part of the Rebel Alliance. You are also a traitor, Vader declared, cutting her off occasionally. His gaze went to a nearby officer. Take her away. She succeeded in reaching him with his with her spit, which hissed against still hot battle armor. He wiped the offensive matter away silently. Watching her with interest as she was marched through his access way into the cruiser. A tall, slim soldier wearing the sign of an Imperial commander attracted Vader's attention as he came up next to him. Holding her is dangerous, he ventured. Likewise, looking after her, she was escorted toward the cruiser. If word of this gets out, there will be much unrest in the Senate. It will generate sympathy for the, rebel for the rebels. The commander looked up at the unreadable metal face and added in an off-handed manner. She should be destroyed immediately. No. My first duty is to locate, locate that hidden fortress of theirs, Vader replied easily. All the rebel spies have been eliminated by our hand or by their own. Therefore, she is now my only key to discovering this location. I intend to make full use of her. If necessary, I will use her up. But I will, I will learn the location of the rebel base. The commander pierced his lips, shook his head slightly, perhaps a bit sympathetically as you consider the woman. She'll die before she gives you any information. Vader's reply was chilling in its indifference. Leave that to me. He considered the moment that went on. Send her a wide band distress signal. Indicate that the senator's ship Encounter an unexpected meteorite cluster it could not avoid. Readings indicate that the shift shields were overridden, and the ship was hauled to the point of vacating 95% of its atmosphere. Inform her father and the son of the all aboard were killed. A cluster of tired looking troops marched purposefully up to the commander and the Dark Lord, Fader eyed them expectantly. Their data chips in question are not aboard the ship. There's no valuable information in the ship storage banks and no evidence of bank erasure. The officer in charge recited mechanically. There were nor were there nor were any transmissions directed outward from the ship from the time we made contact. A malfunction in the lifeboat pod was ejected during the fighting, but it was confirmed at the time that no life forms were on board. Life forms were on board. Vader appeared thoughtful. It could have been a malfunctioning pod. He mused that might also have contained the tapes. Tapes are not life forms. In all probability, any native finding them, finding them will be ignorant of their importance and would likely clear them for his own use. Still, send down a detachment to retrieve them or to make certain they are not in the pod. He finally, he finally ordered the commander. 
any attentive officer. Be as subtle as possible. There is no need to attract attention, even on this miserable outpost world. As the officer and troops departed, Vader turned his gaze back to the commander. Vaporize this fighter. We don't want to leave anything. As for the pod, I cannot take the chance of a simple malfunction. The data might contain Kapu too damaging. See to this person like the matter. If those data tapes exist, they must be retrieved or destroyed at all costs. Then he had a satisfaction. With that accomplished and the Senate in our hands, Senator in our hands, we will see the end of this, of this absurd rebellion. It will, be, it will be as you direct, Lord Vader. The commander announced both men entered the access way, access way to the cruiser. What a forsaken place this is. 3PO turned cautiously to look back at where the pod lay half buried in the sand. His internal guy rose. We're still unsteady from the rough landing. Landing. The application of the term unduly flattered his dull associate. On the other hand, he supposed he ought to be grateful he had come down in one piece. Although he mused as, as he studied the barren landscape, he still wasn't sure they were better off were here than they would have been had they remained on the Captur cruiser. High sandstone mesas dominated the skyline on one side. To one side, every, every other direction showed an only endless series of margin dunes with with long yellow teeth stretching for kilometer on kilometer into the distance. Sand ocean blended into the sky glare until it was impossible to distinguish where one ended and the other began. A faint cloud of minute dust particle rose in their wake as the two robots marched away from the pod. That vehicle, as its intended functions fully discharged, was not quite useless, was now quite useless. Neither robot had been designed for pedal locomotion on this kind of terrain, so they had to fight their way across the unstable surface. We seem to be made to suffer, 3 p.m. moaned in self-pity. It's a rotten existence. Something squeaked on his right leg and he went, I've got the rest before I fall apart. My internals still haven't recovered from the headlong crash you call a landing. He paused, but R2-D2 did not. The little automaton had performed a sharp turn and was now ambling slowly but steadily in the direction of, of the nearest outjut of Mesa. Hey, 3PO yelled. R2 ignored the call and continued striking. Where do you think you're going? Now R2 paused, emitting a stream of electronic explanation as 3PO exhaustedly walked over to him. Well, I'm not going that way, 3PO declared when R2 concluded his explanation. It's too dangerous. It's too rocky. He gestured in the direction they've been walking at the angle away from the cliffs. This way, it's much easier. A metal hand weighed disparagingly at the high messes. What makes you think there's any sediments or any that way anyway? A long whistle issued from the depths of R2. Don't get technical with me, Death 3 one warned. I've had just about enough of your decisions. R2 beeped once. All right, go that way. Through be announced grandly. You'll be signed locked within a day, you and your side scrap pile. He, he gave the R2 unit a contemptuous shove, sending the smaller robot tumbling down a light, slight dune. As it struggled at the bottom to regain its feet, Through Beer started off toward the blurred, glaring horizon, glancing back over his shoulder. Don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it, he warned. Below the crest of the dune, the R2 unit righted itself. It paused briefly to clean a single electronic eye with the auxiliary arm. Then it produced an electronic squeal, which was almost, though not quite, a human expression of rage. Humming quietly to itself, it turned and trudged off toward the sand sandstone ridges as, as if nothing had happened. Several hours later, straining 3PO, his internal thermostat overloaded and edging dangerously toward overheat shutdown, struggled up to the top of what he hoped was the last towering dune. Nearby, pillars and buttresses of bleached calcium, the bones of some enormous beast, 
formed an unpromising landmark. Reaching the crest of the dune, three people peered anxiously ahead. Instead of the hopeful greenery of human civilization, he saw only several dozen more dunes, identical in form and promise to the one he now stood upon. The farthest rose even higher than the one he presently surmounted. Three people turned and looked back toward the now far off rocky plateau, which was beginning to grow indistinct with distance and heat distortion. You malfunctionally little twerp. He muttered, unable to even now to admit to himself that perhaps, just possibly, the RT unit might have been right. This is all your fault. You tricked me into going this way, but you'll do no better. You'll do no better. Nor would he, nor would he, if he didn't continue on. So he took a step forward and heard something grind dully with a leg joint. Sitting down in an electronic funk, they began picking sand from his crusted joints. He could continue on his present course, he told himself, or he could confess to an error in judgment and try to catch up again with R2-D2. Neither prospect held much appeal for him. But there was a third choice. He could sit there, shining in the sunlight until his joints locked, his internals overheated, and the ultraviolet burned out his photoreceptors. He would begin another monument to the struck he will become, Another monument to the destructive power of the binary, like the colossal organism whose picks, picked corpse he had just, just encountered. Already his receptors were beginning to go, he reflected. It seemed he saw something moving in the distance. Heat distortion, probably? No, no. It was de definitely light on metal, and it was moving toward him. His hopes soared. Ignoring the warnings from his damaged leg, he rose and began waving frantically. It was, he saw now, definitely a vehicle, though a type unfamiliar to him. But a vehicle it was, and that implied intelligence and technology. He neglected in his, in his excitement to consider the possibility that it might not be of human origin. So I cut off my power and shut down the afterburners and dropped him. And on in low on Deke's tail, Luke finished, waving his arms widely. He and Biggs were walking in the shade outside the power station. Sounds of metal began work began worked being worked came from somewhere within where where Fixer had to find joined his robot assistant in performing repairs. I was so close to him, Luke continued excitedly. I thought I was going to fry my own instruments in my own Fry my instrumentation. As it was, I busted up the skyhopper pretty bad. That recollection inspired a frown. Uncle Loma was pretty upset. He grounded me for the rest of the season. Luke's depression was brief. Memory of his feet overrode his, immoral his immorality. You should have been there, Biggs. You ought to take it a bit easier. Take it a little easier, his friend cautioned. You may be the hottest bush pilot this side of Moss Island, Luke, but those little skyhoppers can be dangerous. They move awfully fast for trussophoric trus craft, faster than they need to. Keep playing engine jockey with one and someday wham out. He slammed one fist violently into an open ball. There's going to be nothing more than the dark spot on the damp side of a canyon wall. <laughs> Luke is talking, Luke retorted. Now that you've been on a few big automatic starships, you're beginning to sound like my uncle. You've gotten soft in the cities. He swung spears at Luke at Biggs, who blocked the movement easily, making him a half-hearted gesture of, of counterattack. Biggs, Biggs' easygoing smugness dissolved into something warmer. I've missed you, kid. Luke looked away embarrassed. These haven't been exactly been the same. Things haven't been exactly been the same since you left either, but it's been so Luke hunted for the right word and finally finished helplessly. So quiet. His gaze traveled across the sandy, deserted streets of Anchorhead. It's always been quiet, really. Big screw silent thinking. He glazed around, glanced around. They were alone out here. Everyone else was back inside the comparative coolness of his powers power station. 
As he leaned close, Luke sensed an unaccustomed solemnness in his friend's tone. Luke, I didn't come by, come back just to say goodbye or to crow, crow over everyone because I got through the academy. Again, he seemed to, hes to hesitate, excuse me, unsure of himself. Then he blurted out rapidly, not giving him a chance to back down. But I wanted some needs to know. I can't tell my parents. Gapping, gaping at Biggs, Luke can only go. No what? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the talking that's been going on in the academy and other places, Luke. Strong talking. I made some new friends, out some friends. We agreed about the way certain things were developing in his voice drop conspiratorially. When we reach one of the per peripheral systems, we're going to jump ship and join the Alliance. Luke stared back at his friend and tried to picture Biggs. Fun-loving, happy-go-lucky live for today, Biggs. As a patriot of fire with a re rebellious fervor. You're going to join the rebellion? He started. You gotta be kidding. How? Down, down, will you? The bigger man cautioned. Glanced vertically back toward the power station. You got a mouth like a crater. I'm sorry. Luke whispered rapidly. I'm quiet. Listen how quiet I am. You can barely hear me. Big's kind of off in the team. A friend of mine from the academy has a friend of Beston. The sting of my enablement to make contact with the armed rebel unit. A friend of a... You're crazy, Luke announced with conviction. Certain his friend had gone mad. You can wander around forever trying to find a real rebel outpost. Most of them are only myths. This tries to remove friend could, could be an imperial agent. You'd end up on Castle or worse. If rebel outposts were so easy to find, the Empire would have wiped them out years ago. I know it's a long shot, Biggs admitted reluctantly. If I don't contact them now, a peculiar light came into Biggs' eyes, a conglomeration of newfound maturity and something else. I do what I can on my own. He stared intensely as his friend. Luke, I'm not going to wait for the Empire to conscript me into its service. In spite of what you hear over the official information channels, the rebellion is growing, spreading. I don't want to be on the right side, the side I believe in. His voice altered unpleasantly, and Luke wondered what he saw in his mind's eye. He should, he should have heard some of the stories I've heard, Luke, learned of some of the outrages I've learned about. The Empire may have, may have been great and beautiful ones, the people in charge now? It's rotten, Luke. Rotten. And I can't do a damn thing. Luke muttered morosely. I'm stuck here. He kicked futilely at the ever-present Santa Vanga head. I thought you were going into the academy soon. Biggs observed. If that's so, then you'll have your chance to get off the sand pile. Luke snorted derisively. <laughs> Not likely. I had to withdraw my application. He looked away, unable to meet his friend's disbelieving stare. I had to. It's been a lot of unrest among the sand people since you left Biggs. They've been raided the outskirts of Anchorhead. Biggs shook his head, disregarding the excuse. Your uncle could hold off a whole colony of raiders with one blast. One blaster? From the house, sure. Luke agreed, but Uncle Owens finally got enough evaporators installed and running to make the farm pay, pay off big. But he can't guard all that land by himself. He says he needs me for one more season. I can't run out out of run, run out on him now. Big side sadly. I feel for you, Luke. Someday you're gonna have to learn to separate what seems to be important from what really is important. He gestured around them. What good is all your uncle's work if it's taken over by the Empire? I've heard that they're starting to imperialize commerce and all the outlying systems. It won't be long before your uncle and everyone else in Tatooine are just remnant, tenants, slaving for the greater glory of the Empire. That couldn't happen here, Luke objected with a confidence he couldn't quite feel. 
You've said it yourself. The Empire won't bother to eat the frog. But the estranged Luke, only the threat of rebellion keeps many in power from doing certain unmentionable things. If that threat is completely removed, well, there are two things men have never been able to satisfy, the curiosity and their greed. There isn't much the high imperial bureaucrats are curious about. Both men stood silent. The sand world traversed the street in silent majesty, collapsing against the wall to send newborn baby ziphers in all directions. I was, I was going with you. Luke finally murmured. He glanced up. Will you be, be around long? No. As a matter of fact, I'm leaving in the morning to rendezvous with the ecliptic. And I guess I won't be seeing you again. Maybe someday, Bates declared. He brightened, grinning this disarm, this, that disarming grin. I'll keep a lookout for you, hot shot. Try not to run into any canyon walls in the meantime. I'll be at the academy the season after, Luke insisted. More to encourage him than Biggs. After that, he, himself rather than Biggs. After that, who knows where I'll end up? He sounded determined. I won't be drafted into, into the Starfleet, that's for sure. Take care of yourself, you'll always be the best friend I've got. There's no need for a handshake. These two had long since passed beyond that. So long then, Luke. Big set simply. He turned and steered. He turned and re-entered the power station. Luke watched him disappear through the door. His own thoughts as chaotic and frenetic as one of the tattooing spontaneous dust storms. There are any number of extraordinary features unique on Tatooine's surface. Outstanding among them were the mysterious mists which rose regularly from the ground at the points where desert sands washed up against unyielding cliffs and mesas. Fog in the steaming desert seemed, steaming desert seemed out, as out of place as cactus on a glacier, but it existed nonetheless. Meteorologists and geologists argued its origin among themselves, muttering hard, hard to believe theories about water suspended in sandstone veins beneath the sand and uncomprehensible chemical reactions which made water rise when the ground cooled and fall on the ground again with a double sunrise. It was all very backward and very real. Neither the mist nor the alien moans of nocturnal desert dwellers troubled R2-D2. However, as he made his careful way at the rocky arroyo, hunting for the easiest pathway to the mist atop, his squarish, broad foot pads made clicking sounds loud in the evening light of sand underfoot gave a way gradually to gravel. For a moment, he paused. He seemed to detect a noise like metal on rock instead of him, instead of rock on rock. The sound wasn't repeated, though, and he quickly resumed his ambling descent. Upon the arroyo, too far up to be seen from below, a pebble trickled loose from the stone wall. The tiny figure which had accidentally dislodged the pebble retreated mouse-like into shadow. Two glowing points of light showed under on, underlapping folds a brown cape a meter from the narrowing canyon wall. Only the reaction of the unsuspecting robot indicated the presence of the winding beam as it struck him. For a moment, R2-D2 flore florenced eerily into the dimming light. There was a single short electronic squeak. Then the tripod of support unbalanced and the tiny automaton toppled over its over onto its own back. Onto its back. The lights of its on front blinking on and off erratically from the effects of the paralyzing beam. Three travesties of men scurried, scurried out from behind concealing boulders. Their motions were more indicative of rodent, man, rodent than humankind, and they stood a little taller than the, R, than the R2 unit. When they saw that the single burst of energy, single burst of enervating energy had immobilized the robot, they holstered their peculiar weapons. Nevertheless, they approached the limitless machine cautiously with the trepidation of hereditary cowards. 
Their cloaks were thickly coated with dust and sand. Unhealthy red yellow pupils glow cat like from the depths of their hoods as they studied their captive. The job was conversing low guttural croaks and scrambled analogs of human speech. If, as an anthropologist hypothesized, they had ever been human, they had long since degenerated past anything resembling the human race. Several more Jawas ap appeared. Together, they succeeded in alternately ho hoisting and dragging the robot back to the Ororo. Back down the Ororo. At the bottom of the canyon, like some monst monstrous prehistoric beast, with a sand crawler as enormous as its owners, and operators were tiny. Several dozen meters high, the vehicle towered above the ground on multiple treads that were taller than, than a tall man. Its, its metal epidermis was battered and pitted with, not with, from withstanding untold sandstorms. On reaching the crawler, the Jawas resumed jabbering among themselves. r 2 2 could hear them, but failed to comprehend anything. He need not have been in prayers as, at his failure. If they so wished, only Jawas could understand other Jawas. For they employed a randomly variable language that drove linguists mad. One of them removed a small disc from a belt pouch and sealed it onto, sealed it to the R2 unit's flank. A large tube protruded from one side of the gargantuan vehicle. They rolled them over to, to it and then moved clear. There was a brief moan, a whoosh, a powerful vacuum, and the small robot was sucked into the bowels of the sand crawler as neatly as a pea of a straw. This part of the job completed, the job was engaged in another bout of jabbering, follow, following which they scurried into the crawler via tubes and ladders. For all the world, like a nest of mice, they turned into their holes. None too great, too gently, the suction to deposit the R2 in the small cubicle. In addition to varied piles of broken instruments and outright scrap, a dozen or so robots of different shapes and sizes populated the prison. A few, a few were locked in an electronic conversation. Others muddled aimlessly about. But when R2 tumbled into the chamber, one voice burst out in surprise. R2-D2, it's you, it's you, called an excited 3 people from the near darkness. He made his way over to the still immobilized repair unit and embraced it most unmechanically. Spotting the small disc sealed into Archie's side, the 3PO turned his gaze thoughtfully down to his own chest, where a similar device had likewise been attached. Massive gears, poorly lubricated, started to move. With a groaning and grinding, the monster sand crawler turned and lumbered with relentless patience into the desert night. That was chapter two of A New Hope. Hope you enjoyed that reading. I'll be back with Star Trek, Star Trek Fleet Command very soon. Bye-bye.